information and our objectives are pretty simple. We're going to be able to, uh, after today, explain remote replication technologies, the different tools that go into it, synchronous and asynchronous. We'll be able to discuss and host array-based remote replication, and you'll be able to describe the functionality, the differences, and you'll be able to select the appropriate technology for your organization in uh, whatever industry you're in. And we will discuss network options for remote replication. So RPO and replication stands for point, recovery point objective. And what that means is basically uh, recovery point objective is a metric in the context of data replication and the disaster recovery planning. So it represents a maximum of acceptable amount of data that an organization is willing to tolerate in the event of a system failure or a large disaster. Basically, it defines the point in time in which data must be restored after recovery. RPO refers to a point in time backward from the instant that failure occurs. An RPO can determine replication mode and the sizing of the links used for replication. Basically, what we're saying is that the chosen RPO heavily influences the design and replication strategies for the company. Shorter RPOs require more frequent data replication to minimize potential data loss. So as a result, organizations need to adopt a more aggressive replication methodology. Often that will involve uh, synchronous replication where the data changes are copied almost immediately to the secondary system. But on the other hand, longer RPOs might allow for asynchronous replication, which introduces a slight delay between the data changes and the replication. Additionally, RPO influences the sizing of the communication links used for replication. Smaller RPOs demand higher bandwidth connections to support the rapid transfer of data. Conversely, uh, larger RPOs might permit the use of lower bandwidth links. So as there are uh, longer time frames within uh, the replication changes. So if the primary system fails and the failover occurs, the RPO basically represents a worst case scenario. The data available on the secondary system should ideally adhere to the established RPO. However, due to the nature of the failure and the timing of the failure, uh, there might be some instances where the actual data recovery falls short of the desired RPO, resulting in some degree of data loss. So it's important to stress here that the RPO sets an expectation for the amount of data loss that might occur during a recovery process. Organizations ought to carefully balance the desired level of data protection with the associated cost of achieving and maintaining a particular RPO. So RPO is created at a remote site and it addresses the risk associated with regionally driven outages. And it could be a few miles away or it could be halfway around the globe. Modes of remote replication based on the RPO requirement are synchronous replication and asynchronous replication. In synchronous replication, the data is copied to the remote site in real time or at least very near real time. This means that every write operation is first sent to the primary site and then immediately replicated to the remote site before uh, confirming that the right application uh, has transpired. Synchronous replication offers a very low RPO, often achieving zero data loss. So uh, the thing to remember is that it can introduce some latency to the application due to the round trip between sites. So that's something to keep in mind. Now with asynchronous replication, uh, that introduces a slight delay between the right operation at the primary site and the replication to the remote site. Data is usually collected in batches or, or chunks 
uh, based on a predefined schedule uh, before uh, sending it out to the remote site. And asynchronous replication provides uh, greater flexibility in terms of latency, and it's often more suitable for greater distance scenarios where minimizing the impact on application performance is a priority. The RPO is synchronous um, in, in, uh, in synchronous replication is uh, typically higher uh, compared to, I'm sorry, I said that backwards. The RPOs in asynchronous replication is higher compared to the synchronous replication. There, got it right. <laughs> so basically what we're trying to say is that uh, remote replication involves the, the duplication of copies of data at a geographically distant location to ensure that the data is available for the business continuity during regionally driven outages. The choice of replication mode, whether it's uh, we're talking about synchronous or asynchronous, depends on the organization that you work for, their, their RPO requirements, and the ability to tolerate data loss. So, something to keep in mind. The RTO in remote replication stands for the recovery time objective. It is another metric that tells us the duration of time and a service level within which a business process must be restored after disaster in order or to avoid unacceptable consequences associated with a break in continuity. And this is going to depend very greatly depending on uh, what industry you're in and that organization's particular um, standard for the RTO. The RTO basically exists for us to answer the question, how much time did it take to recovery to recover after the notification of a business process disruption? So in, in the event of some kind of a large scale outage or other disaster, uh, how long uh, did it happen with a similar scenario? So basically it draws on historic data and helps us to establish a type of a benchmark. And that becomes our, hopefully a realistic expectation of the objective. And we wanna tighten that, we want to improve it for next time. So a replica, is available at a remote facility and it could be like we said a few miles away it could be around the world backup and vaulting are not the same thing as remote replication remote replica replication involves remotely logging in virtually from one location to another physically at the same time and performing the backup that that way rather than creating a backup on site and then transporting that data off site as we talked about in the past with duplication Remote replication or replica at a remote facility is uh, not the same thing as vaulting. In synchronous replication, the replica is identical to the source at all times. There's zero RPO. The data is exactly the same. In asynchronous replication, not necessarily. The replica is behind the source by some margin, not, not a big margin, but there will be a small RPO. And that's to be expected in that scenario. So again, this falls upon your organization and your IT team's expectations. The network infrastructure over which the data is transported from the site to the remote site determines the type of connectivity. In synchronous replication, we are establishing the right commands that are committed to the source and remote replica before it is acknowledged to the host. It ensures the source and remote replica have data that's identical at all times. Remember, that's what synchronous replication involves. Same data in separate locations. The writing order is maintained by uh, having the replica receive the writes in exactly the same order as the source. It occurs almost like a parallel service. Synchronous replication provides the lowest RPO and RTO. The goal, of course, is zero. Now, in a perfect world, it would be that all the time. However, in the reality, uh, probably not always going to hit that benchmark. RTO is as small as the time that it takes to start the application on the target site. So not locally, but the target site, uh, however long that takes to start, that's your RTO. In synchronous replication, the bandwidth requirement goes a little bit like this. We have a maximum, and right in the middle of this wavelength is your typical 
workload. The required bandwidth has to be at the level of the greatest uh, frequency. This is the RTE, the response time extension. Basically, the application response time will be somewhat extended. The data has to be transmitted to the target, and it's not there instantly, um, but it's transmitted before the write can be acknowledged. So there's a bounce back, there's a, there's a handshake process uh, that occurs. The time to transmit will depend not on the distance so much as the, the bandwidth. <clears throat> to minimize the impact on the response time, sufficient bandwidth needs to be provided constantly. It has to be consistent. It should be noted that it's rarely beyond 200 kilometers. In asynchronous replication, the write command is committed to the source and immediately acknowledged to the host. The data is buffered at the source and transmitted to the remote site later. And some vendors maintain right ordering, some do not. Other vendors uh, tend to maintain the right ordering, but ensure that the replica will always be consistent uh, restartable. And there's a finite RPO. The replica will be behind the source by some small amount. It won't be significant, hopefully, but it will be noticeable. And it's important to note that it is typically configurable. It depends on your equipment and exactly uh, what distance we're dealing with. In asynchronous replication, like with synchronous replication, there's a requirement on the bandwidth. The required bandwidth is the average here of the normal curve. And the typical workload might be up here. The response time should be unaffected. There needs to be an average bandwidth, which represents the uh, summation of the extremes averaged out. There do need to be sufficient buffers, and it can be deployed over long distances. In remote application technologies, they are typically host-based technologies that are LVM-based, in other words, logical volume manager. And that is a system that is configurable to support both synchronous and asynchronous modes. In log shipping, that is a uh, part of the host-based system, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. In storage array-based replication, you're also supporting both synchronous and asynchronous mode. Uh, it is disk buffered. It has consistent PITs. It is a combination of local and remote applications. An LVM-based shipping looks like this. You have duplicate volume groups at the source and target sites. The capacity is the same in both locations. All the writes to the source volume group are replicated to the target volume group by the LVM. It can be, like I said, either synchronous or asynchronous. And in the event of a network failure, the writes are queued up in the log file and sent to the target when the issue is resolved. And the size of the log file determines the length of the outage that can be withstood. Upon failure at the source site, production can be transferred to a target site. Now there are some advantages and some disadvantages, advantages of LVM-based remote replication. Advantages include the fact that you have different storage arrays and RAID protection levels that can be used at storage and target sites. So there's a certain flexibility there. The response time issued can be eliminated with asynchronous mode with an extended RPO. The limitations include an extended network outage that uh, could require large long file, log files, not long files, log files. And the CPU overhead on the host can be substantial. In log shipping, that is the process of automating the backup system. The transaction logs on a primary production database server automatically send data to the server uh, at a remote site. It then restores them on a standby server. And this technique is supported by Microsoft SQL Server, 4D Server, MySQL, and PostGRE SQL. In host based log shipping, the logs are sent to the standby via the IP. 
which are then back up and stored remotely. That way, if there is a break in the network, you've got the standby protection ready to go. And this setup is offered by most database vendors. There are some advantages, like there's minimal CPU overhead and low bandwidth requirement. And it's standby database consistent to the last applied log. So as long as that automated system is working, it should always have a recording of the most recent backup. In storage array based remote replication, replication here is performed by the array operating environment. The host CPU resources can be completely devoted to the production operations instead of replication operations. Arrays will communicate with each other via dedicated channels, and that's all that they do. It can be an ESCON, fiber channels, or gigabit ethernet, or gigi. And replicas are on different arrays. They're primarily used for DR purposes and can also be used for other business operations. In array-based synchronous replication, the write is received by the source array from the host server depicted here. Then the write is transmitted to a target by the source array to the target array and it's sent back. The target array sends an acknowledgement to the source array, like a handshake saying, we got it. And the source array signals the write complete to the host server. In array-based asynchronous trans, uh, replication, write is received again by the source array to the host. The source array signals a write complete to the host server. Then the write is transmitted by the source array to the target array. And the acknowledgement is bounced back to the source array. With this system, there's no impact on the response time. And it can operate with extended distances between arrays. You're not tied to the 200 kilometer uh, limit. And it offers a operation at a lower bandwidth compared to synchronous. And the standard, like we said uh, previously, is based on an average rather than a min max. With asynchronous replication, the challenge is to ensure consistency. You want to maintain the order of the write commands, and some vendors attach a timestamp and sequence number with each write, and then sends the writes to a remote array. Wait one second. It applies these writes to the remote devices in the exact order that they were sent based on the timestamp and sequence numbers. The dependent write consistency is ensured when some vendors buffer the writes in the cache memory of the source array for a period of time, usually between five and 30 seconds. And at the, at the end of this time, the, con the current buffer is closed in a consistent manner and the buffer is switched with new writes that are received in the new buffer. The closed buffer is then transmitted to the remote array. And a remote replica will contain a consistent restartable image on the application. In array-based disk buffered replication, the data comes from the source host to the source data in the storage array. The acknowledgement is sent and the data is transmitted to the remote replica. And the local and remote replication technologies can be combined to create a consistent PIT copies of the data on the target arrays. The RPO here is usually in the order of hours. However, there is lower bandwidth requirements and you have an extended distance possibility. In tracking changes in remote replicas, uh, they can be used for BC operations. Typically, remote replication operations will be suspended when the remote replicas are used for BC operations. Now, during business operations, changes will and can happen to both the source and remote replicas. Most remote replication technologies have the ability to track changes made to the source and remote replicas to allow for incremental resynchronization. In other words, you will not have to sync up the entire data blocks, just the incremental.
environments which were affected. So resuming remote replication operations will require a resynchronization between the source and the replica. So with all that being said, in array-based replication, how do we choose the right technology? Excuse me. Use synchronous replication if it is an absolute must that a zero RPO is required. And understand the need for sufficient bandwidth at all times. Rarely it's above 125 miles. So there's a distance factor and there's a requirement factor for RPO being minimized. For asynchronous, that's ideal when you have extended distances and a minimal RPO. If you can withstand RPO within minutes, that may be the way to go. Uh, there's no response time elongation, and it generally requires lower bandwidth than synchronous. So it costs a little bit less to operate. It must be designed with an adequate cache and buffer capacity. For disk buffered technology, extended distance solution here offered with RPO uh, within the order of hours. And it requires lower bandwidth than both the synchronous and asynchronous. So there's not one perfect catch all solution. Uh, your organization might be the one that benefits from uh, more than one of these. It just depends on the needs and the, the actual requirements for that organization. In three-site replication, uh, this scenario eliminates the disadvantages of a two-site replication because a single-site disaster could lead to a window when there is no DR protection. Data are duplicated on two separate sites. And it's implemented in one of two ways, three-site cascade multi-hop or three-site triangle multi-target. In the multi-hop, it looks like this. You have synchronous and disk buffered technology where the source site sends the synchronous data to the bunker site. The disk is buffered and the local replica sends the data to the other remote site where the remote replica takes it, stores it on that site's remote uh, local replication. In synchronous and asynchronous, the source site sends the synchronous data to the bunker site. And there's only uh, the one replica. It sends it out asynchronously to the remote site where the remote replica takes the data. In multi-target triangle replication for three site replication, you've got the three that are operating like with a star topology. It's like a ring network. You have the source technology here. Oops, let me back up. Let me hit that. The source sends synchronous data to the bunker, which sends uh, asynchronous with differential resync to the remote site, which works in both directions. So you have synchronous and asynchronous operating at the same time. One remote site taking the asynchronous and the synchronous data going to this bunker, and they're shared back and forth. With this application, if there's a break in the network between one of two locations, in theory, the data can be sent and received the, on the other side. Now, I, I have not personally worked in an organization that deploys this, but that's supposed to be an advantage of that. In SAN-based remote app replication, that's where we re replicate from one storage array to any other storage array over the uh, storage area network or wide area network. You implement tiered storage, and it's used for data migration and remote vaulting. In heterogeneous arrays, uh, there's no impact to servers or the local area network. In SAM-based replication, you have a control array, which is where a control device operates here and is responsible for the replication technologies for the push and pull to the uh, remote device. In the remote array, the array uh, represents the to and from for which the data is being replicated. The remote device is the device on the remote array to and from which data is being replicated. An operation operates with push and pull 
and the push, the data is pushed from the control array to the remote and pull, the data is pulled to the control array from the remote. And it's depicted here. So when it goes to the remote side, it's a push. When it returns, it's a pull. Network options for the remote replication include a dedicated or shared network, which could be in place for remote replication like uh, fiber channels or ESCON. For extended distances, an optical or IP network should be used. Consider uh, for that DWDM or Sonnet networks. Protocol converters may require to connect the ESCON or FC adapters from the arrays to these networks. And native gigi adapters allow the array to be connected directly to the IP networks. In DWDM or dense wavelength division multiplexing, that is where we put the data from a different source together on an optical fiber with each signal carried on its own separate light wavelength. That's how they're able to take multiple T1s and put them on a fiber. And it could be an OC48, OC192. There are different configurations. And it's just all about taking the, uh, the data, aggregating it, and digitizing it, sending it out to a multiplexer, which breaks it down and sends it out to end users. And it can use up to 32 protected and 64 unprotected separate wavelengths of light, which can be multiplexed onto a light stream and transmitted on a single optical fiber. That's how they're able to get so many services on one fiber filament. Now, fiber is uh, smaller than a pencil and they have a glass filament inside it, very easy to, to break. But the, the trade-off is that all the separate wavelengths can be operated at the same time. As long as, as long as they're not synchronized together, there's no ingress or egress. Uh, you can have those different services, which then reach the remote site, which demultiplexes it, breaks it down, and sends it out. In the Sonnet service, or synchronous optical network, it uses time to division multiplexing technology. Traffic from multiple subscribers is multiplexed together and sent out on a single sonnet ring as an optical signal. Synchronous digital hierarchy or SDH sonnet, uh, but it is the European standard. And because it's that, I don't know much about it. I just work in North America. And the sonnet SDH, uh, it offers the ability to service multiple locations. It has reliability and availability, automatic protection switching, and restoration. There are a couple different levels of protection. Typically, a multiplexing shelf has an, an active card and an, uh, a card that's not active, but it's the protect. So if there's a, a fault in that card itself or the slot, it switches over to the protect card and sends an alarm to the IT team who can then change out the bad card. The customer never notices a, a change in service. And the same thing happens at the T1 level. You've got, you've got eight cards in a row, seven of them with four T1s, and that eight, eighth card is a protect card. So if something happens to the uh, fiber or the T1 on a DS3 or whatever the case may be, uh, on one of those cards, the card can be backed out and service is automatically sent to the protect card, and then it's replaced. That's assuming there's a problem with the hardware. A lot of times it's a problem in the field, like in the fiber itself or the coaxial cable, whatever the medium is. All right, so we have covered some good stuff here today. We talked about modes of remote replication, synchronous and asynchronous mode, host-based remote replication, LVM-based and log shipping, array-based remote replication, synchronous and asynchronous, disk buffered, three-site replication, SAM-based remote replication and network options for remote replication. That is as much as we're going to cover for today. I hope that that has been interesting. Uh, this is stuff that I tend to work with in my job a lot. And so uh, we could we could talk about some, uh, some, some more of that if you have questions about it specifically. And uh, that's about it for now. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And I will talk to you guys again next week on Tuesday when we start week nine. And we'll be looking at module six pretty soon. So hopefully some of you are ready for that. And everybody out there, stay safe out there. Uh, stay healthy and have a great weekend. We'll talk again soon. Let me know if you have any questions or concerns. Give me a call or text 252-458-7176. And I'm Dr. Dex. 
We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.